I'll admit a certain trepidation in approaching this miniseries. The 21st Century Battlestar Galactica is a series that's led to much discussion and disagreement. It was met with disapproval by some fans of the original series who wanted to see a continuation of the original Battlestar rather than this rebooted version, this reimagining as it's been called. The finale is a very divisive issue for some fans that felt it ruined the series as a whole, or there are various points where it felt that the show started to take a turn for the worse, but in short, there's a lot of negative feelings surrounding the series in one way or another, to different degrees for different people. What I won't be doing is comparing this series to the original. To do so would either reduce this all to a mere list of bullet points, which would serve little purpose since you can just go out and read those yourself and all over the net, or to get into the larger issues which will eventually lead to taking sides, which I don't want to do either. I should also mention that this look is focused on the miniseries, not on the entire series. But there may be spoilers if you haven't watched the series. The new series was created by David Icke, who helped develop Hercules, Xena, and Sci-Fi's The Invisible Man. And Ronald D. Moore, whom you should know from the numerous Trek reviews, was involved in the franchise for a long time. The direction they chose to take with the story was to make it as grounded in reality as they felt they could, and in so doing, to give a show that wasn't so much about future humans as it was present-day humans with a few small differences. This would then create more of a feeling of connection between the audience and the plight of humanity here. Because of this, the concept of humanity being nearly extinguished and being on the run leads to the bleakness of the miniseries because, well, that's a bleak concept. The apocalypse is often a bit of a bummer. I'll be addressing this a bit more later on. Part 1 opens up with the backstory, as a diplomat or something is sent to this station to be ready to negotiate with the Cylons, should they ever show up. You see, the humans built the Cylons, but they became smart enough to rebel, so there was this bloody uprising, until an armistice was finally declared. They left decades ago and haven't returned until... this butt-puckering moment. And there's a new kind of Cylon, one that looks human. Why did we ever build her? To make us sandwiches. The Cylons then blow the place up because it's way better than just shooting the one guy that's on board and calling it a day. Hey, that's my camera, you jerks! Over on the Battlestar Galactica, this guy, sporting the latest from the David Tennant collection, fills us in on the background of the Galactica, which is about to be retired. It was one of the first of the battle stars, created to be low-tech to remove any chance of the Cylons being able to infiltrate their systems. So despite being more advanced than us, the technology looks, frankly, like it would have been state-of-the-art when they were making the original series. Perhaps this is most apparent when Commander Adama here reaches the CIC. Ron Moore had previously spoken out against the repetition of the bridge motif on Star Trek, that no matter the era, there is always a captain's chair and a big screen. So in Galactica, we had neither. In fact, a lot of Galactica is zigging wherever Trek zagged. Trek humans had no religion. Here, they do. Trek had aliens. Here, no aliens. Trek had strange anomalies. Here, no anomalies. Trek has no conflict amongst the crew. Here, plenty of conflict, and so on. It wasn't exactly rebelling against Star Trek, but we do have to remember that Star Trek had, at this time, been the dominant science fiction program for over 15 years. So working to avoid treading the same ground was going to be vital, to not come across as just another clone, which is something I personally see often when it comes to someone trying to talk about their own ship, this subconscious Star Trek-like approach to it. Not that Star Trek is bad, of course. I mean, like... Mint is good, but the world would suck if everything tastes like mint. Oh, and not everyone is perfect. Oh, there's three of them there. I'm not sure which one I should salute. Some are downright awful people, but then, with the ship being decommissioned, things have been allowed to slide a bit, a uh, bit more for some. But perhaps this will give them the moment to shine. Oh, uh, there's three of you, too. What, what do you mean? I'm not a Cylon! Chief Tyrrell here is in charge of keeping the birds in the air, and as a special surprise, he's got Commander Adama's old Viper here to help in the celebration of her decommissioning and transformation into a museum. He's even given a very touching memento, a picture of his two kids standing with Fonzie. Nothing can really diminish this wholesome image. Good news, Booze. That last performance was so good we're taking this show on tour. 
So what we have here, kids, is a washed-up second-in-command who's been buying liquid courage from the corner gas station, playing a game of cards against a mouthy, short-tempered pilot by the name of Starbuck. As you can imagine, this combination soon leads to... Starbuck's off to the brig, but Adama has a soft spot for her because she's an incredible pilot and connected to the family. He tries to talk Colonel Ty out of pressing charges. But you did kick over the table first. I did not. Unless I did. I'm not sure. I left my memory in my other bottle. On Caprica, in Caprica City, Caprica Secretary of Education Laura Roslin's here to find out about her Caprica medical checkup. I'm afraid the tests are positive. The mass is malignant. It's advanced well beyond the Hey, can, can you vacuum later? I'm with a patient. It turns out she's been diagnosed with breast cancer. Um. <clears throat> well, this is getting uncomfortable. Let's let's just skip to the next scene. Oh, it's number six with the baby. Yeah, watching this once was one time too many. Thank you. Uh, moving on. Oh, this entire review is going to be about eight minutes long at this rate. Ah, Dr. Gaius Baltar. Good. He's unlikely to do anything that'll make me want to drink like Colonel Ty. He's not aware that Six is a Cylon, but he has discovered that each Cylon toy comes with a special light-up spine, the buttons located inside the vagina. Their relationship is more than just perpendicular. Baltar's a genius who's responsible for software for most of the Colonial fleet, software Six helped rewrite. In return, he'll let her use his access to enter the defense mainframe on the pretense of getting info for her company to bid on defense contracts. No, you did it because you love me. That, and God wanted me to help you. Oh yes, the Cylons aren't just doing this on a whim. They're doing it because they're operating under the Elwood Blues Protocol. We're on a mission from God. Laura Roslin's ship has finally arrived on Galactica to remove some of the components Galactica won't be needing after it's turned into a museum. Roslin's just here for the museum conversion, which she feels could be helped by using a computer network, but Adama puts his foot down on that. She mockingly accuses him of being afraid of computers. Many good men and women lost their lives aboard this ship because someone wanted a faster computer to make life easier. Well, after last week's look at insurrection, I obviously can't let this go without comment or I'll be hided. There are two reasons, though, that I'm not holding Adama to the same standard as the Baku. One, the Baku reacted by rejecting all technology, period. Adama doesn't reject technology, he rejects technology that moves into an area where he thinks it's dangerous, and in this case, danger proven by what happened in the last war when network computers were used. Oh, and two, the Baku were presented as if they were perfect, something you cannot accuse Adama of. One thing about the characters of Galactica are that the humans are all flawed people, and not just to the point of drinking and starting fights. Baltar's a self-absorbed, arrogant hedonist. Starbuck thinks she is a license to push people, and now we're going to find Adama's. Up until now, everyone on his crew has been openly admiring the man. But now his son, Apollo, arrives, and he's the first person who doesn't. You're going to have the honor of flying the actual Viper that your father flew almost 40 years ago. Great, that's, um, that, that's quite an honor. He's gotten really good at hiding that sarcasm. Hints are dropped as he visits Starbuck in the brig, that his brother died, and Lee blames his father for it. After a photo session with him, Adama tries talking with him, but Apollo is too upset to have the chat his father wants, saying that his brother's death was his fault. He actually died in a flight accident after he had chosen to join the service and become a pilot, his choice. But there's also no denying his father had spent years planting the idea in his head with remarks like, A man isn't a man until he wears the wings of a Viper pilot. It was still his choice, but it was also his father who consciously or not convinced him to get into the suit regardless of whether or not he was actually capable of it. Of course, actually saying, Face it, you killed him, is taking that a little bit too far. And to anyone who has lost a child is probably the most sadistic thing anyone could ever say. Adamus tried to bury this by just reminding himself that accidents happen, to use his years of experience and tragedy to try to just add this to the pile, while all Lee can do is, well, try to look for a target for his anger. Back on Caprica, Baltar is banging some stranger. Six likes watching, I think. 
He babbles away his excuses once he's discovered, trying to sound contrite, which is going to be important for the rest of his run. Balter's excuses may be bad here, but he speaks them with what sounds like total sincerity. Everything he says for the series, you can't just take it at face value, because he is so self-serving that he seems capable of lying about anything and sounding as if he believes it. Six reveals that she's a Cylon, and he's skeptical at first, but the more she says, the more he believes her, until when she reveals that the access he provided her was all part of the plan for their invasion, he gets worried. When he realizes the full scope of this, he immediately thinks about himself. Even the robot girl's impressed at how heartless that is. At the ceremony, Adama is called up to give a speech. He quickly changes it on the spot, speaking from the heart. You know, when we fought the Cylons, we did it to save ourselves from extinction. But we never answered the question, why? Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Why are we as a people worth saving? We still commit murder because of greed, spite, jealousy. And we still... Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Visit all of our sins upon our children. We refuse to accept the responsibility for anything that we've done. Like we did with the Cylons. Adama's speech actually contains two of the themes of the series. The first is the relationship between child and parent, in both a literal and a figurative sense, of those who create and those who are created, and those who lead and those who are expected to follow. Ideas like, should a leader ignore the wishes of the people because he or she knows they're making the wrong choices? What lengths will a child go to to earn the respect of the figurative parent? And at what point does Pete's comment from last week I'm your dad. It's my job for it to be my fault. No longer apply. The other is the first part, about the question why. It's considered part of the darkness and lack of hope that some dislike about the show, but yet, it's actually meant to be a bit of light within it. It says that it's not just for those who manage to survive to survive. They should earn that right to survive by being better people in spite of the situation. And that they will not always succeed. They are only human, after all. But that doesn't mean they won't continually try to make the best out of a bad situation, and in so doing, earn the right to survive. 